Okay, thank you. So, um, as I said before, the origins of this group was that a number of folks from the Unitarian Universalist Church of New Braunfels decided to investigate um, what individuals and small groups could do to affect climate change. And we identified this book as a good place to start. So the group was comprised of about 14 members of our church and others joined uh, from time to time, including members of the larger uh, community. We had two hour discussions after church on six Sundays um, to discuss uh, the topics you see listed here on the right of the slide, how the methodology was done, energy, food, women and girls, buildings and cities, land use, transport and materials. So we originally decided that we would put together an Earth Day um, service uh, that would be a, pa a panel uh, comprising groups, members of the groups dividing up each of the topics but then the coronavirus hit. And so I, since I was leading the group, I got uh, denoted as the person to go ahead and put this talk together and uh, give it in our church on Earth Day. And because Sarah was a member of the group, Sarah Riggs, um, Sarah is the one that decided to try and arrange for me to give the talk to your Native Plant Society. I think you'll see in this talk, there's a lot that has to do with plants. Um, Diane, sorry again. Apparently, I don't have the ability to let any of these other members in, and I have somebody waiting in the waiting room. It's only letting you be, I only have one host at a time, apparently. Okay. Um, again. <laughs> I let him in. You're okay. going to have to tell me every time that happens, okay? Because I can't see it from my screen. Will do. Okay, so about Project Drawdown. Um, Project Drawdown was organized by Paul Hawken, whose picture you see here, in 2013 to identify, measure, and model 100 substantive solutions to determine how much we could accomplish within three decades to peak and then begin to draw down greenhouse gases. A coalition of researchers, students, and scientists were invited to become fellows for the project. At the time of the book's publication in 2017, the fellows numbered 70 and they came from 22 countries. Half had PhDs and all had at least one advanced degree. All have extensive academic and professional experience and come from many of the world's most respected institutions. The team put together a list of climate solutions that had the greatest potential to reduce emissions or sequester carbon. They compiled literature reviews, and detailed climate and financial models for each solution. The findings were then peer reviewed by outside expert reviewers. Solutions were ranked by the total impact they would have for carbon dioxide gigaton reduction if implemented over a 30 year period using a reasonable forecast for their global adoption. The top 15 are refrigeration, onshore wind turbines, reducing food waste, plant-rich diet, tropical forests, educating girls, family planning, solar farms, silvopasture, rooftop solar, regenerative agriculture, temperate forests, peatlands, tropical, stable trees, and afforestation. Many of the solutions prevented in this, presented in this book uh, require implementation by governments or large institutions or organizations, but some of the solutions discussed in the book can be assisted or fully implemented by individuals and small groups. Those and some discussions of the top 15 uh, solution is what I'm going to be talking about through the remainder of this discussion.
energy, the world's reliance on fossil fuels is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Technologies that can shift that reliance to clean renewables are now on the rise, especially since solar and wind energy are now competitive with coal, gas, and petroleum. Wind turbines, when located onshore, are ranked as the number two solution by drawdown. Utility scale solar farms rank number eight, and rooftop solar ranks number 10. Um, sorry, uh, individuals and small groups can have an impact first and foremost by saving energy. The less we use, the fewer greenhouse gas emissions we produce. Where individuals have a choice in the source of their energy, individuals can opt to select wind or solar production or other sources of renewable energy. And if income allows, individuals and small organizations can put rooftop solar on their buildings. Food um, is another important contributor to the solution. Turns out what we eat has a major impact on climate change. Our food system is um, pri very complex and multifaceted. Fossil fuel, powers farm equipment, fishing vessels, transportation, refrigerants, and supermarkets. We use petroleum-based synthetic fertilizers and other chemicals on crops that make their way into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide, a powerful greenhouse gas. Livestock emissions include carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, which accounts for 20% of greenhouse gases annually, a source second only to fossil fuels. If you add livestock to all the other food-related emissions like farming and food waste, what we consume becomes the most important cause of climate change. Reducing food waste and eating a plant-rich diet rank number three and number four, respectively, as solutions to reducing emissions. Individuals and small groups can have a huge impact by eating a plant-rich diet. The University of Oxford modeled the climate, health, and economic benefit of a worldwide transition to a plant-based diet between 2016 and 2050, and it found that emissions could be reduced by as much as 70% for a vegan diet and 63% for a vegetarian diet that included dairy and eggs. And there would be health benefits as well. For those that feel they cannot eliminate meat, consider using meat as a delicacy rather than as a staple, or try Beyond Meat or impossible foods. Individuals and small groups can also have a major impact on food waste. A full one third of the food that we raise does not make it to the fork. That's a very alarming number in a world where hunger still plagues 800 million people. That wasted food contributes 8% to our greenhouse gas emissions each year, in large part because it goes to a landfill where it turns into methane. Silvopasture, or the integration of trees and pasture or forage into a single system for raising livestock, could also help, as could regenerative agriculture, which seeks to preserve the soil through multiple crop rotations, low or no tillage, the planting of diverse cover crops, and organic farming. These practices rank number nine and number 11. While mon many of us can't have much impact on implementing these unless we're farmers, we can still do as Michael Pollan advises and plant a garden and compost. When affordable, we can buy organic produce. We can encourage the preservation of tropical staple trees, 
um, like bananas, avocados, breadfruit, and coconuts. And that is solution number 14 in drawdown. 51% of the population of the world is female and global warming is not gender neutral. Because of existing inequities, women and girls are more vulnerable to its impacts. That said, <clears throat> addressing the inequities that women and girls face could go a long way towards providing a solution. Educating girls and family planning rank number six and number seven <clears throat> in the list of solutions. Educating girls is very important because women with more education have fewer and healthier children, <clears throat> which tightly links to the goal of reducing population or at least population growth rates. If family planning efforts are not successful, United Nations projections of a world population of 9.7 billion by 2050 might be a low estimate and the reality might turn out to be a world closer to nearly 11 billion people. While individuals and small groups may not be able to do much to affect these phenomena directly, <clears throat> however, we can financially support programs that focus on family planning and educating girls. Worldwide, buildings account for 32% of energy use and 19% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. Many approaches are being pursued to make buildings and cities part of the global solution uh, to climate change, including erecting buildings that produce as much energy as they consume. These are called net zero buildings. Making cities walkable or bikeable. <clears throat> installing green or living roofs. Replacing outdated light fixtures with LED lights. Using energy efficient heat pumps. Building with smart glass and smart thermostats. Using district heating. Improving the building's insulation and retrofitting older structures to be more energy efficient. <coughs> Excuse me. While many of these approaches might be beyond the grasp of individuals or small groups, some are reasonably easy to undertake. For instance, homeowners can be sure to check their insulation to assure that it has the adequate R values. Homeowners can check to see that the fans on their AC units are correctly adjusted as fan speeds are often incorrectly set. Many local utilities offer free home energy audits to assist homeowners with these tasks. Homeowners, to a certain extent, uh, renters, can swap out their old incandescent and compact fluorescent bulbs and replace them with LEDs. LEDs use 90% less energy than an incandescent bulb and 50% less energy than a compact fluorescent. While many land uses are associated with food production, several other important land use concerns are independent of the food system. Forest protection is one. Deforestation reduces the number of trees and there is also the loss of carbon from the soil when you cut a tree down. This is especially the case when fire is used to clear the land for planting and when the land is peatland. Stopping deforestation and restoring forests could offset one third of carbon emissions worldwide. Tropical forests are particularly important. Those forests used to be 12% of the Earth's land mass but now account for just 5%. Restores, re, re, restoration of tropical forests ranked number five as a solution to the global warming problem. About 25% of all forests are temperate forests of the Northern Hemisphere. Protecting and restoring these forests ranks 
as climate change solution number 12. Protecting peatlands is critical and Rang says climate change solution number 13. Peatlands or bogs or mires are comprised of thick mucky waterlogged ground made up of dead and decomposing plants. Under pressure and heat over time, peatlands become cold. They cover only 3% of the Earth's land area, but are second only to the oceans in the amount of carbon that they hold, twice that of forests. Because they hold so much carbon, they can become a powerful greenhouse gas emitter if they degrade. That can happen with fire, especially when lands are cleared for planting of palm oil plantations or when they're drained for timber production. Aforestation or creating new forests is yet another land use change to fight climate change. Aforestation ranks number 15 in the list of solutions. New forests can emerge by planting native trees as recommended by Japanese botanist Akira Mayawaki. He calls for dozens of native species to be planted close together, often on degraded land. As they grow, natural selection occurs, resulting in a resilient forest. Aforestation can also occur through tree farms or simply by local efforts to plant trees. Individuals can be part of this effort in two simple ways. Plant trees. Don't buy products with palm oil. Improving the efficiency of planes, trains, ships, trucks, and cars that rely on fuels distilled from crude oil is key to drawing down carbon. The transport sector also must innovate to find new and better modes of mass transit for our increasingly crowded cities. But also by inventing and scaling the use of electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are four times more efficient than gasoline or diesel powered vehicles. Bikes allow for transport with no emissions. Individuals, if they can afford to, can invest in transportation technologies that are more efficient. If EVs are out of reach, perhaps hybrids or plug-in hybrids are a viable solution. Groups can also arrange for carpools where appropriate. Easy to use apps like www.groupcarpool.com can help in that effort. The way we manage materials holds a particularly important place in reversing climate change. We are a long way from a circular economy in which products are designed to be fully recyclable at the end of their useful life, but producers are paying more attention to reducing material use, removing some undesirable materials from production and use, and recycling materials that can be returned to fruitful use. Households and industry have, since the 1970s, been aware that recycling saves energy and minimizes pollution. The recycling of paper, for example, has many benefits. Forests are not cut down. Water use is reduced by a fourth. Bleach and other chemical use is minimized and fewer greenhouse gases are emitted as less energy is used to make the paper than would be the case with virgin materials. Recycled paper generates just 1% of the climate impacts that virgin paper generates. One material stands out as critical for successful drawdown of greenhouse gas emissions, refrigerants. Modern refrigerants were developed in the 1920s. The first of these were chloral fluorocarbons or CFCs. CFCs were later discovered to be the cause of the destruction of the protective ozone layer. And so international talks that culminated in the Montreal Protocol began to phase out the production and use of CFCs. Alternative refrigerants were developed in the 1980s, including 
hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs, or hydrofluorocarbon, HFCs. HCFCs were later determined to be bad for the ozone layer and were also scheduled for phase out under the Montreal Protocol. HFCs, while better for the ozone layer, were later determined to be extremely potent greenhouse gases. For instance, HFCs can be 1,000 to 9,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide, depending upon what chemical formulation is used. HFCs were added to the Montreal Protocol's list of chemicals to be phased out in 2016. However, that phase out will take many years. While these refrigerants pose some risk at all stages of their life cycles, the greatest risk of leakage to the environment is after their useful life. Nearly 90% of leakage of refrigerants happens after disposal because they are not properly disposed. They corrode and leak their harmful chemicals into the atmosphere, causing significant global warming impacts. Individuals and small groups can fight climate change in several important ways. First and foremost, they should ensure that they dispose of products containing refrigerants conscientiously. Responsible disposal means using a service provider who complies with legal provisions that dictate handling practices so that hazardous materials do not negatively impact the environment. Individuals and small groups can also be on the alert for incidents of incorrect disposal and should contact the appropriate environmental authorities when you witness one. Individuals and small groups can also recycle. Most communities have recycling facilities available. If income allows, we can try to buy products that contain recycled materials. Individuals and small groups can also buy in bulk and manly, manually refill containers rather than sending them to a landfill or to recycling. We can also take political action. Individual acts alone will not solve the climate crisis. We need political action. So we can all press our representatives to support efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And since this group was um, and, and is part of the Unitarian Universalist of New Braunfels, I'm closing with a quote from a 19th century um, Unitarian minister, Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. And now I'm going to stop my screen share and we can talk. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Diane, there were a lot of things discussed there that were I kind of felt bigger than an individual. Um, and I, I love that quote at the end. How could we as individuals or say like a group in the Native Plant Society um, go about making some of these uh, changes or supporting these changes? Well, all of you eat, right? <laughs> So one of the big changes you can make is your diet. Uh, Plant-based diets are really important for bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can, um, if, if you can become a vegetarian or a vegan, if that doesn't match your lifestyle, you can um, maybe skip eating meat once or twice a week. Or as some of the carnivores in our group um, decided, they went to um, Burger King and they have um, Beyond Meat and they loved it. They said it was fabulous. 
So you can seek meat alternatives. That's one really easy way you can have a huge impact on uh, climate change. And that doesn't cost you a lot of money either because you're going to be paying for food one way or another. Because since you're a plant society, um, you know, you might think about uh, uh, working together with other groups and joining community gardens. Or you could work with urban arborists to plant uh, urban trees or, um, or other efforts to reforest areas that have become depleted. Those are just a handful of ways that I think uh, you could uh, begin the process of um, bringing down some greenhouse gases. If you haven't already changed your light bulbs to LEDs, LEDs are pretty inexpensive now. They've come down way in price. You can make sure you check your house, make sure you take all your old compact fluorescents and any incandescents that you still might have and replace them with LEDs, which will not only save energy, but they'll save you money over time because they last for 20 years and they use very little energy. So that's a very simple thing you can do. You can check to make sure that your house is appropriately insulated. I don't know uh, if No Braunfels does it, but I know San Antonio, if you call CPS Energy, they will send an energy auditor to your house that will point out all the places in your house that's leaking and how you can, how you can fix that all up. So all of those things are simple um, one-step efforts that you can take to affect climate change. The other okay. thing you can do, of course, is contact your representatives and make sure they understand that you are a voter and that you consider this an important issue. Thank you. I think somebody is trying to ask yeah, you. There. <laughs> you mentioned uh, electric vehicles, plug-in vehicles. What about hybrid vehicles? I have a, a Prius and it gets 58 miles to a gallon. Okay. So uh, I realize I'm not pulling a boat. <laughs> so, um, you know, the vehicle has to be appropriate for the task. Um, but um, electric vehicles, all electric tend to be a little bit more expensive. Um, but hybrids are, um, good and reduce uh, gasoline mileage as do plug-in hybrids. Um, okay. Maybe all can't afford a Tesla, um, but, but we, can, we can afford a hybrid. Okay, to follow up on that, um, some, uh, I was at the garage not too long ago and uh, the mechanic was saying he did not own a hybrid because the costs of building the hybrid battery were so high and so detrimental to the environment because of the rare earths needed uh, that uh, he just didn't think that was the right thing to do. do well, you know, that may be out of your field of expertise. No, the batteries are a problem. There's no question about that, but they can be uh, adequately disposed of at the end of their life. But the good news is, is that we're just um, around the corner from a million mile battery. Uh, R&D is being done right now and um, it, at Tesla and other companies, and they're developing batteries that will last for a million miles. So uh, as with other innovations, you know, the initial innovation may not be the perfect innovation, but it's going in the right direction. And I think, this is Joel, I think some of that is climate change denier propaganda. You know, they get from Rush and folks like that, that, that uh, the Priuses are terrible and the batteries are all that bad and it costs you know, terrible to the environment. You know, it's not true, guys. <laughs> and a lot of those things can be re, uh, recycled. Uh, and there's some now that they're using the, the uh, Prius battery packs 
to use for your house batteries because even though it still won't run your car, they still you can pull out some of the ones that are bad, the cells that are bad, and use them for your house. Yeah, I'm. I've been um, finding the same thing. We did just buy a Tesla, and I was concerned about the battery. And that's what I'm starting to understand is is uh, these companies are getting better and better at refurbishing the batteries, reclaiming parts of the batteries that they aren't necessarily just going to landfills. And, and I, as I understand it, it's not just the batteries, the other parts of the car last a lot longer on the electric cars, which may be why a mechanic would say, don't get one. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Lots, fewer moving parts in an electric car than there is with an internal combustion engine, that's for sure. Yeah, that's true. I didn't realize until we started looking at the Tesla that, you know, of course, um, you're not going to have oil changes, um, that you're going to uh, replace your bat, uh, your um, brake pads very infrequently because you use the um, active braking uh, with the accelerator. You rarely use the brake pedal. So yeah, there's so few moving parts. That's one of the things that really kind of interested us in the vehicle. Um, plus we have our own solar panels. So we're charging it mostly off our solar panels. Mm. Um, Bethany, if you're trying to talk, if your mucus, your mic is muted. I was just going to say, I know with PEC, you can choose to have, um, the energy that you get from them can be all <coughs> from, um, uh, renewable sources. You play, you maybe pay just slightly more. I mean, it's just like maybe a dollar or less more per month, but you can choose that your energy comes from renewable source. I'm not sure how they do that, but um, I have chosen that supposedly the energy that I get is all from renewables. So that's <laughs> Yes. Oh, great, thanks. I'm glad to but, hear that. But they only did that once. It was a one-time deal. They haven't offered it again. So either you jumped in and got in then, or you don't. <laughs> so maybe in the future they'll do it again because it sold out very quickly. Well, it sounds like that's the end of the questions. Uh, so I, I, unless somebody has another question or comment, I oh. want to go ahead. Can I make one comment? Uh, some of y'all know that one of my things is I'm an expert on tobacco. And one of my things I'm an expert on tobacco is, is tobacco industry front groups. And many of the tobacco industry front groups and um, the folks associated with them uh, moved over to do climate change stuff also. So if any of y'all, you would like me to forward some stuff, y'all can put it on the website if you want to. But some of these groups who both work on tobacco denial and climate change denial, and you can find out where some of these little things about Priuses are bad for the environment actually originate. Yeah, that's absolutely true that the, uh, the climate change deniers use the same group of people that the tobacco industry yeah. uses tell you that cigarettes don't cause cancer. That's right. Yeah. So Joel, are you saying those are paid groups? Yes. Yeah, Exxon Mobil. And Coke, Exxon. Yeah, there's a whole group of them. They, they put a ton of money into it, um, especially in the 80s and 90s. They put a ton of money into it. If you're interested in um, the some of the politics of this, there's, um, let me just get this book. There's an excellent book by um, Nathaniel Rich, 
just came out. I'm using it in one of my classes that I teach. Uh, it's called um, Losing Earth, A Recent History. And it discovered, it talks about the decade from 79 to 89 and, and looks at all the politics and why we didn't do anything to deal with climate change back then when we, we, we could have um, very realistically. So if you want to read uh, some more background, he also talks about the funding that ExxonMobil and the other oil companies to climate denialism. Well, I have enjoyed talking to you. I'm sorry we got off to a rocky start. Thank you so much, uh, Diane, for being with us tonight. I, en I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your meeting. Uh, Absolutely. What's going to happen if I end? <laughs> um, I'll just reclaim host. And okay. then, uh, so I'm going to reclaim host. OK, you're host now. So, so now I'm host and yeah, if uh, I can leave the meeting. Yes, absolutely. So thank you again. Bye, Diane. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Diane. Okay. Bye-bye.